uh, I'm going to now uh, speak to you about uh, a topic that has a certain uh, certain relevance to what we've just spoken about. It's it's indeed about time, and it's about continuous versus discrete time abstractions. And what I was um, just describing to you, uh, we were talking about continuous time, hazard rates, a chance per unit time of leaving. Um, and I spoke about dividing up an interval into arbitrarily fine subcomponents. And this is a very popular way of characterizing time within agent-based models. But it's not the most traditional such way. It's not the longest established such way. And in fact, it may not even be currently the dominant such way because of uh, the historical baggage associated with the development of, of agent-based models. Agent-based models um, uh, were uh, far, more, um, far more recent in their flourishing but they go back to the work of another, of a pioneering computer scientist, appropriately enough, um, within the 1930s and 1940s, uh, von Neumann. Uh, now, von Neumann was a polymath. And uh, was he a computer scientist? Yes. Is he lenses, he graces his, or his, his name graces the, the uh, predominant architecture we use in modern computers. Those of you viewing this through the lens of a smartphone, or of a laptop uh, will, will perhaps be aware uh, that you're running those devices on von Neumann architectures. Um, but von Neumann also introduced uh, uh, some alternative models of computation, one of which was a cellular automata, which was an early agent-based model. And um, that was formulated in discrete time, okay? Uh, time proceeded in uh, from one time point to another a fixed length. Uh, and all the agents would update in lock update in lockstep at a given time point. So uh, within that transition, there was kind of an instantaneous transition where they all updated and uh, and then they would, they would then determine their next, uh, what, how they would update for the next time point based on that updated state and all update together, et cetera. Um, now this is in some sense similar to what we saw as in system dynamics with fixed time steps. Even though system dynamics hues to a continuous time abstraction, how it's numerically integrated is in fact in, in fixed time steps. And, and that will be at variance from some of the options in agent-based model. Um, the point here is that all of these changes are applied at once. And in system dynamics, we computed all the flows based on the current value of the stocks. And then all at a single time point, we updated all the stocks with the values of those, according to the values of the flows that, that were themselves calculated based on the, the previous values uh, of the stocks. And so all the stocks are conceptually updated at once. And discrete time agent-based modeling uh, makes use of, of that abstraction as well. Now, there's trade-offs associated with this from two standpoints, at least. Uh, two major ones I'll talk about today are conceptual trade-offs on the one hand and uh, algorithmic trade-offs on another or implementation trade-offs. I'm speaking to you, ladies and gentlemen, as computer scientists, uh, not only as, as budding modelers. And within this sphere, I'm, I'm broadening my description from what I might, uh, uh, might lend in terms of understanding to other, other crowds that I teach worldwide. So at a conceptual level, um, uh, we, we have a series of discrete time points where we have to update and and what that means is, let's suppose we're updating, you know, only every week for a COVID-19 model. We have to kind of batch together. We have to kind of group together and somehow account for all sorts of things that would have happened in the past week. You know, maybe some people got infected. Maybe some people who are already infected had to be hospitalized. 
maybe some of the people who are hospitalized um, would have infected healthcare workers in the hospital, um, but other people, potentially the same people who are hospitalized might have passed away um, uh, whilst in the hospital. Um, all of these things that have played out in the past week somehow have to be batched together at this time. And um, one of the things that gets confusing in this context is we have to choose uh, a certain ordering for these updates. Like, do we consider infections as occurring before, before we update deaths, for example? If so, um, someone could infect someone and then pass away. But if we do deaths before infections, then they won't be able to infect anyone because they're already counted as, 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 as being left out um, by, by that time point. Um, and uh, moreover, we, we might have to consider you know, admissions and discharges. And often there are these kind of competing risks, these things which can occur to a given agent. They could pass away, they could be discharged, they could get infected, they can infect others, et cetera. And the ordering that you impose because of dependencies logically can cause artifactual results. And there's a long and sundry history with an agent-based modeling. Uh, it's kind of a sorry thing where some really interesting agent-based modeling results have, have been proven to be artifactual in the sense that they disappear if you have a different ordering of the, uh, um, of the occurrences within this you know, past week. I've got to account for everything that occurs. And you know, I chose COVID-19, but the same issue plays out for any number of different areas um, uh, that you have often these different competing events. And if you have to impose an arbitrary ordering on them, you may be predisposing the model artificially to produce certain types of results. So those are some conceptual trade-offs that complicate this and, and sometimes make it a bit of thorn in our sides as modelers. Um, there's also uh, some algorithmic trade-offs, which can also be nuisances that are exposed to the model developer, but they can also be uh, exposed to um, and lead to more work or more opportunities for, variously, for developers of agent-based modeling packages, um, of which there is a crying need for something less uh, primitive than today's packages. Um, so within this context, um, uh, we have very simple implementation of discrete time model. Uh, and it, it can be implemented by something as simple as a loop, right? You, you just loop through time points. And for each, each loop through, each iteration of the loop, you call off and you get the model to do its thing, right? And, and it, will, it will update accordingly and you, you get it on to the next time step. And I think this is somewhat of the attraction of it. After all, most people who used um, agent-based models earlier on um, were, were not computer scientists. Sometimes they were social scientists. Sometimes they were physicists. Um, sometimes they were mathematicians and sometimes economists. And um, they weren't familiar with some of the more sophisticated tools we have at our disposal as computer scientists. And, you know, putting in place a simple loop was something that was conceptually straightforward and uh, amenable to, to, you know, low risk implementation. Uh, but there's some problems that come in here. If you, if you buffer, if you, if you only update things uh, at particular intervals, um, what you're doing is you, you want to update the states of all the agents um, in a way that hopefully won't depend on the vagaries of what the ordering of the update is. So suppose you have 100 agents, right? Um, uh, and you update them in a certain order uh, in a naive way. So you have uh, agent zero update, agent one update, agent two, agent three, uh, and so on. Um, that sounds nice. It's easy to implement. The problem is that one of the hallmarks of agent-based modeling, as we discussed from the get-go, was our interest in agent-to-agent -agent interaction because agents interact in diverse ways. 
they influence one another. They infect one another, right? They, they end up um, uh, educating one another. Uh, they can impose burdens on one another. Um, for any of these reasons, often agent one depends for its, its changes on agent zero. And if agent zero has already been updated, this is yet another artifactual um, dependency we've created. And you may get results out um, that are different if you update agent zero before agent one or agent one before agent zero uh, is updated. So in order to sidestep this obvious coupling, which is so central to the, to the enterprise of agent-based modeling, to the goals of agent-based modeling and examining emergent behavior from agent-agent interactions. There's two primary um, uh, ways in which we, we handle this. Um, uh, the first is what's called double buffering. And I remember working on this uh, back long before probably most of you were born in 1990 um, when I implemented a, a meta compiler uh, for an early agent-based modeling system. Um, uh, and here, we basically had two representations of state. There was an odd state and an even state. And essentially, uh, you'd compute the even one based on the, the state and the odd. So you would update over in the even space, the state of the model. Um, and because you wouldn't be touching the odd space, um, uh, it, it wouldn't matter what order you did that in. Uh, all those updates would use the information in the odd buffer to, to update the even buffer. And then the next time point, you go back and you'd update the odd buffer based on the value of the even buffer. And you go back and forth alternating. The idea is that you don't touch the things you depend on for the update. So agent one dependence on agent zero isn't harmed if you update agent zero because it's, you're only updating agent zero's representation in the other buffer, not in the one that agent one depends on which agent one depends. So this is called double buffering, and it, it, it tended to work pretty well, although you needed twice the amount of memory. Um, a, a separate option is, you know, you, you kind of go through all the agents. You say, hey, figure out what your updates are going to be, buddy. And so it goes through all the agents, one by one, and they all figure out how they're going to update, right? Um, how they will update. They don't actually do the update, and they don't commit to it. It's a two-phase thing, much you have, like you have two-phase commits in distributed computing protocols. Um, and each of them goes through and computes how they will update, plans out their entire update. None of them has changed, so there's no problem with dependencies. There's no problem of, of ordering there. And then you say, okay, perform all of your planned updates, and they all update, boom. And, and, and there you get the updated state. Uh, because they have pre-planned it, the order in which they actually perform the updates based on those plans is irrelevant. So those are the two ways in which we deal with it. And any logic tends to the latter, okay? Uh, and we'll see this in a second. Now, it bears noting within each discrete time step, um, uh, and I, I credit uh, my colleague, Chris Duchin, for making a sage observation about this. Uh, there's opportunities for parallelism because in principle, we should be able to ignore dependencies there. Um, we're trying to abstract away from dependencies. So there's opportunities within each discrete time step to perform things in parallel. So the way in which, so any logic is a package that by default uses um, continuous time and it's to its credit that it does. Um, but you can enable discrete time in any logic within main you, you uh, there's a little box within the properties for main that that you basically can implement discrete time steps, okay? And uh, and this allows for supporting certain events, which basically um, uh, go through and tell the model to update in, in lockstep. Um, and uh, there's these event handlers called on before step and on after step that basically you put code in for and on before step lets you plan what your update's gonna be based on the current state of things. You're gonna plan how I will update and on after step um, 
uh, or on step itself will will then go through and, and perform those updates. Okay, um, so um, this uh, this on before step and on step can be used to plan out what you're going to update and then perform the updates, for example. Um, and uh, you can, you know, you can uh, put in place the logic using things like asking what's the state of my neighbor in the next cell over, for example, in the current time step with the confidence that it hasn't yet been updated. So that's discrete time. Discrete time is a simple model. It's a model suitable for a uh, very, you know, quick uh, model implementation according to uh, technologies that, um, that have been around for decades. But we live, ladies and gentlemen, in 2021. And uh, we have as computer scientists, a broader set of options afforded to us. Um, and this has swept in, particularly within the past 10 or so years, um, continuous time abstractions. So continuous time abstractions um, uh, have a more natural feel to them. Um, I can say that as someone who's, who's used both models extensively. Um, here, every agent uh, is updated at different times. Um, time, um, the time abstraction reflects the, the richness of um, continuous time in, in, in real life. We have sort of natural timing between events. So it's not that we have to figure out everything that went on in the past week, you know, oh, there are infections to consider, there's discharges to consider, there's deaths to consider, you know, admissions, et cetera. Um, uh, we don't have to all consider those in one fell swoop at one period of time and, and try to artificially figure out which takes precedence. Instead, things happen at times in the model that actually are reflective of their tempo and their, their timing in, in the, uh, the external world. Um, uh, things can occur as quickly as possible or, as, um, uh, or in large periods of stasis. So for example, we might have punctuated times where you know, we have a burst of activity going on. And then we have long periods of time where we might have stasis, you know, very little happening. And continuous time uh, affords us this opportunity to, to uh, have that sort of zoom in on certain periods and, and at the same time go very quickly when there's not much happening. Um, now, uh, what this will reflect is, for example, that different agents Instead of all being updated, you know, at the end of the week, everyone's updated, everyone's updated, everyone's updated, such as von Neumann undertook with his cellular automata back in the 30s or 40s, and together with Stanislaw Ulam. Um, here, we have no two agents that are updated at the same time commonly. Uh, I may get infected at a different time than you at a different time than this other person. Um, and uh, that's captured at, you know, the natural uh, points it is rather than being patched up. Um, so the state that I see when I'm infected is reflective of what, what applies, what obtains at that time. Um, I don't have to worry, oh, well, you know, do I update before you or you update before me? Um, that's all handled. If I happen to get infected before you, then, then um, so be it. And I impose a risk of, of infection. And, well, okay, I'm not, I'm not uh, imposing much of a risk here, except maybe for a computer virus, right? Uh, don't worry, I won't inflict that on you. Um, so uh, so there's, no or there's no concern about which agent you know, what order the agents get updated because they're being updated at different times. And what supports this under the hood, under the hood of any logic is a, um, uh, within the continuous time abstraction, something called an event schedule. And I should, whoa, I should use, um, um, you know, a bit of time to, to explain what I mean by event here. And uh, I'm going to, talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes um, from the standpoint of event handlers, but suffice it to say that, remember um, 
the definition of dynamic system with which we started, the informal definition was, it's a system with a state where that state evolves in ways that are reflective of that state over time. So the evolution of the state is governed, in fact, by the state itself. And we, we noted at that time that that would take different forms uh, for the different types of modeling. In system dynamics modeling, the state is updated through rates of change, right? It, as computed by flows. Um, and uh, we have rates of change of, of, of the state. The state is captured in stocks and the rates of change of them depend on the values of the stocks, right? The number of people infected newly in the next little bit, the next day, uh, depends on the number of susceptibles now and the number of infectives now. So it depends on state. And uh, how that updates the state is through the flows and the flows determine how quickly the number of infectives rising or falling or staying the same, right? Um, within agent-based modeling, we have a larger repertoire, as I've said. We have, for example, uh, state charts, and we might have many state charts characterizing different aspects of a person. This showing uh, a model related to uh, opioid addiction through uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and, and through street drugs and uh, attempts at, at quitting and, uh, and risk of overdose, uh, et cetera. And, and uh, this model uh, has tremendous numbers of transitions and it's really within a discrete, uh, within the context of dynamic modeling, when you're talking about change, affecting change in the state that is so linked in with the notion of, of, of uh, dynamic modeling and dynamical systems, that uh, the event scheduler comes in because the event scheduler is actually used beneath the hood of any logic. Anytime we have change, that change could come when people change between states and state charts uh, due to a timeout, due to you know, some fixed period of time, um, uh, due to a rate transition, due to a message transition, um, uh, due to the arrival of a person at a resource, maybe it's a support group for, uh, uh, for staying sober from, for, uh, from um, opioid related matters. Um, all of those might represent a change in the state of the model. And all of those are associated with events and an event schedule. Alternatively, we may have formal event constructs that represent schedules of events, sort of predefined schedules of events, um, perhaps occurring at a certain rate, oh, hazard rate, there it is again. Um, they can occur at a certain hazard rate, at certain you know, uh, average tempo of occurring. Uh, they also might go off at fixed times, say for reporting, we wanna report out the number of bison with anthrax. Um, we do so through, uh, through an event, for example. Um, there's also a construct called uh, a dynamic event, which sounds like a, a bit of a, um, of, a, of a misnomer. I mean, in the sense of a bit of a, a needless duplicate, but it basically reflects the fact you can schedule it a defined period of time ahead and wrap it up with all the information it needs to do its job at that time. So for the next you know, amount of time you specified, it'll just be waiting there with the information needed to perform the eventual event which might be the birth of a baby bison, um, you know, uh, a year from now or something like that. And uh, I don't know how long the gestational period is. Um, and uh, you, you specify at the time of its, uh, of its creation who the mother is and you create it as a dynamic construct. And you say, hey, you're gonna be a baby bison in six months, maybe another, um, another bison is also pregnant, you create another instance of the dynamic event to go off for that baby bison. And when that happy event, that happy day arrives, the baby bisons will be born um, uh, and, and uh, they'll have the information on who their mother was, um, which is always a good thing to know. Um, so uh, another case where we might have these um, uh, these events is in the case of stocks and flows. So stocks and flows in any logic, just like events here, just like transitions, 
are associated with events that are scheduled in a schedule. And any logic will schedule the updates to the stock and flow model on its schedule. Those are things to do. Um, those, uh, every time it wakes up, it's time to make the donuts and it will go update the value of the stocks from the flows. When uh, we have a timeout transition, it will pre-schedule a time, a certain amount of time from now is determined by the specified value of the timeout to use by which I will plan to leave the current state. Um, so maybe we come into the state here and some amount of time later, maybe it's two days later, we'll leave to go to this other thing. Or maybe it's seven days later, I develop complications for COVID from when I came into this state. And so that may, may lead to a later uh, event. Um, so uh, these transitions are all pre-scheduled. These updates, the stock and flow model are all pre-scheduled. Uh, these events are pre-scheduled uh, at fixed times. And every time you fire off one of the rate events, um, uh, you, you'll schedule the next and it will be drawn from an exponential distribution. You know from our last lecture, uh, last, last little module today, why that is, it goes down as e to the minus alpha t. So it draws from that distribution and pre-schedules the event for when it will occur next. Same thing with a rate transition. When you come in here, it'll pre-schedule that rate transition from a high functioning state to a disordered state. Um, uh, and in general, all these transitions are associated with these events. So any logic is, is an event handler. And in fact, if you go and you look at the the panel for any logic you could bring up on the side while you're running an any logic model, it'll report things like events per second that are being processed right now. And you could see it'll do, you know, a million events per second. So it's ripping through the schedule. But it's not so trivial. If you think about it, not only do you add events to the schedule and remove them when you handle them, but you also have to deschedule some things that are no longer needed. So let's imagine, for example, that someone comes into uh, a given state of a, um, uh, of a uh, former user. And uh, they're in this state for some period of time. Um, uh, perhaps they're uh, under treatment right now. There may be a timeout associated with them to go to not under treatment. But before that timeout is realized, they may end up falling back because of adverse companionship, for example, into uh, use of, of opioids again. Um, so they may be preempted by another transition. This is particularly common when you have a message transition. So for example, maybe I have a transition associated with um, uh, my uh, you know, eventual return to work. But before that, I get a message transition that says I'm infected by COVID-19. And uh, I enter, you know, a convalescence state and an isolation state that prevents me from going back to work. That would end up descheduling the originally scheduled event because another event has preempted it, it has occurred first. And message transitions um, and conditional transitions, this is a little question mark, are particularly common in this, in this way. They can occur at any point, And if they occur, they can say, hey, any other transitions that were already scheduled to leave this state, you know, um, you get descheduled because I take precedence here. I'm, I'm uh, being handled. So descheduling is also a need and things can be descheduled in the future if an agent dies, for example, uh, is removed from the model. So there's actually a lot of, uh, a certain amount of logic that has to go on in managing the schedule. None of this are things you have to worry about as modelers per se, but it's good to realize that the schedule is behind the surface and if you, uh, below the, the surface. And if your model is behaving slowly, it may be because you've loaded it down with events to handle. And indeed, um, if you have lots and lots of short, rate transitions, for example, it's going to load down the schedule and cause any logic to potentially uh, slow to, to molasses, like molasses as far as its progress. Okay, So um, uh, you should be aware that the event scheduler is going on 
beneath the surface and uh, that it has a sizable footprint on uh, the performance of the model. But you never would get involved in explicitly saying, you know, kick that event out of there. This is all any logic's doing based on the semantics of the higher level constructs that are afforded us. Things like stocks and flows, things like state charts, things like the, uh, the events, dynamic and, and, uh, and uh, uh, traditional, et cetera. Those are the constructs that, uh, that drive these, uh, these scheduling and descheduling of flows. Um, but you know, if anyone's interested in implementation of agent-based models, uh, this is you know, key things to be concerned about. And, and indeed our, our research group, our lab, the Confidential Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab, we, we do build our own agent-based modeling uh, systems um, uh, in more contemporary style. We seek to innovate there. And these are uh, very important constructs in that context. Okay, um, so I've spoken about continuous time, discrete time. Discrete time involves this kind of lockstep updates for every agent. It's conceptually simple to think about as kind of a loop around and, and updating agents but it ends up imposing conceptual overhead and algorithmic overhead, as well as some opportunities for parallelism. By contrast, continuous time models are very natural in their feel. There's a lot of headache and risks of artifactual results that you sidestep when you engage in continuous time modeling. And uh, it is supported um, through an event scheduler in which events occur as frequently as needed or um, with, with long periods between them as required. And this sort of discrete event processing can afford us opportunities for performance enhancements as well. Because unlike in system dynamics where we, we go through every time step and update things step by step throughout the entire time, for many models, like with agent-based models, you may go through long periods of stasis where there's very little going on, and then periods where there's bursts of, of activity, you know, an outbreak occurs and, and all hell breaks loose, um, and then periods of, of relative stasis, say over the summer where, where there's a lot less happening. Okay, um, so that was my second major topic, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for today.